And I would ask us to set aside whatever ideological or political camps we might belong to and whatever narrative that it is that perhaps you have bought into, suspend that for just a moment so that we might have our narratives instructed, shaped, changed, and even substituted by that which God has given us in His Word. Eight minutes, 46 seconds, is how long the police officer's knee was on the neck of George Floyd. Two minutes, 40, 53 seconds after he was unconscious. Did the officer intend to kill him? I don't know. God knows his motives. Was it the direct cause of his death? Well, perhaps studies and analysis has shown it was just one of many contributing factors. God's word will not let us quibble over whether what happened earlier this week to George Floyd was murder or not murder for the denigration and the desecration and the humiliation of any person made in the image of God is, according to Jesus in Matthew 5, murder. Perhaps not in a capital sense, but it is nevertheless to devalue a human life, to dehumanize another image bearer. But even then, after I saw the video, it's one of those images you know, I'm sure for many of you who watched the video, George Floyd, it's one of those images that you can't get out of your mind and yet I still just kept plowing through this week while I'm just going to stay the course. I'm going to preach this sermon from our church covenant on evangelism from John 11. I spent the week preparing and writing and even last night I was a little bit uncomfortable with it, just didn't really feel right, but I just kept crafting and, and working on it and this is all in the wake of of protests, some which have been peaceful, some which have been not so peaceful. It's been in the wake of cities literally being on fire, communities being burned down, businesses being destroyed, all on the heels of the reality of an entire community in our country that is the black community that has gone unheard and unseen, not just for a month, not just for a year, but for four centuries. Some of you in here have been alive long enough to even remember Jim Crow South. And if we think for a moment that there are not residual effects of institutionalized racism that lasts not only in our own lives, but to our children's lives, then we are fooling ourselves. It's not to say that there's not personal responsibility. There is. It's not to say that there's not personal sin. There is. But when you get a whole group of sinners to organize life together in a nation, and they do politics and policy, and they do industry, sin gets systematized, greed gets systematized, prejudice gets systematized. The Bible will not allow us to leave sin merely on the level of the individual person. If that were the case, God would not be making all things new. Now we may quibble over when and how and by what means those structures will be renewed and revamped. I tend to take, because of the nature of human sin, a somewhat more pessimistic view. Though I think the gospel is certainly through conversion, bringing dead people to life and our changing lives and changing communities, that will, that transformation will not finally and fully occur until Christ comes again and we look forward to that day. So last night I'm preparing my sermon on evangelism and I run across, I can't stay off of Twitter, it was most of the time a mistake, I don't think it was last night, and I'm tuning in to the riots around our country, and I'm watching specifically Dallas riots that's 45, 50 minutes away from my front door, and I'm, and I'm watching 
Peaceful protests seem to get interrupted by tear gas and rubber bullets, and I see that give way to peaceful protesters going home and rioters coming, and those riots presumably even being planned by whom nobody knows, it's just presumed. To where last night you see a shop owner chasing away looters with a sword only to be beaten to an inch of his life by a mob. Who initiated? Who was ultimately responsible? I don't care. Our world is on fire. Injustice is being met with injustice. And that's the, that's the hard thing about injustice in this world. It takes a second for injustices to occur. But justice, real justice, is much more slow and we're not patient enough for it. So we ignore clear commands in the scripture. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and we will take vengeance into our own hands. And on the one hand, we need to deeply sympathize with those who have not been seen and have not been heard and we need to listen, and we need to lament. Before we start talking about what kind of public policy we think needs to be in place, before we start having conversations about socioeconomic changes, transformations, any of those kinds of things, before we get into any of those kinds of conversations, we need to stop, and we need to sorrow. We need to lament. We need to stop drawing lines on who started this, who did that, who's, and we need to go, this is not the way the world was intended to be. People are getting hurt and wounded and killed. Injustice is flooding our cities. The rage that is inside the hearts of many are now igniting our communities. And I don't have all the words. I I don't have them. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to do what God's people have always done when faced first with the fires of injustice. We're going to lament. As I told you earlier, One-third of the psalms, more than a third of the psalms, are lament psalms. It's almost as if God knew that we would be facing things like this and that we would need vocabulary and categories to understand both Him and the world around us so that we might be able to, to have words to what is in our hearts to describe it accurately, to articulate it in a way that is profitable. And what you find in many of these lament psalms, there's 53 of them, out of 150 is how often they don't say the right Christian thing. They ask questions that often we're too embarrassed to ask. Not just of ourselves, but of God. Why? How long? Where are you? When? Oh, no, no, no. We're not supposed to ask those kinds of questions. Not if you're a good, faith-filled Christian. A God-inspired Bible would say otherwise. God is guiding us into how it is that when we see what we've seen this week and this month and for years and centuries to stop and to lament. Is there repentance that needs to be done? Perhaps our lament will lead us there. Is there praise for God's grace that, that He is deserving of our praise? Perhaps and our lament will lead us there. Is there greater love that we can show to one another and to our neighbor. Yes, our lament should lead us there. Is there greater sympathy that we could have for those who suffer? Yes, our lament should lead us there. That is the goal of lament. But in all of that, the goal, the ultimate goal of lamenting is to hope in God. That when our cities are on fire, when the wicked seem to be winning, we flee to God. Open your Bibles to Psalm 11. We've looked at this psalm recently. Last night, I knew that a sermon on evangelism is not what our church needed. It's not what my heart needed. But 
But the Lord has given us words so that we might live and respond and pray and weep in a way that brings Him glory. Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot it in the dark at the upright and heart. If the foundations are destroyed, then what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds and the upright shall behold his face. I'm gonna move quickly through the psalm This morning, this should be a shorter sermon than what it typically is, less than an hour, I guess. (laughs) Much shorter than that. And I hope that it ends in a time where we can lament together with hope. We see in verses one through three that David is rejecting bad counsel. We don't know what his circumstances are, and on this, the psalm is deliberately silent. And that seems to be on purpose, perhaps for universal application that it doesn't matter whether you're facing what David is facing. It doesn't matter if your trial is David's trial. All those who face trials can respond as David responds here in this psalm. It is for God's people in every circumstance. And in verses two and three, the wicked, as we notice here, seem to be winning. The foundations seem to be crumbling. And David is scared enough to want to flee and he's fearful enough to look for refuge but the counsel that he's received in the face of his fear and insecurity is only the counsel of despair. In verse 3, what can the righteous do about it? The implicit answer of course is, at least according to these counselors, nothing. There is nothing that you can do. So the counselors around him offers no help, offers no hope, because their counsel offers no God. And as a culture, we have our own set of counselors in the form of 24-hour news cycles and celebrity soapboxers and clip bait headlines and social media vitriol, endless competing voices telling us not only what is happening, but how we should be thinking every second of the day about what is happening. And they offer no help. And they offer no hope because their counsel offers no God. Is there any wonder why our nation is so anxious? Those competing voices can be found, I fear, even among Christians, even the most well-intended Christians, voices who in the midst of months-long pandemic and on the heels of yet another act of violence against an unarmed black man tell us what good Christians should think and should not think what good Christians should do and should not do what good Christians should feel and what good Christians should not feel. It can all become really confusing really fast, really overwhelming really fast. And no doubt there are a number of godly and helpful guides out there, yet I fear that even among so-called Christian voices, many counselors seem to stoke rather than to put out anxieties. And their counsel, however well intended it may be, fails to offer help and hope because their counsel offers no God. It offers a perspective. They're full of political perspectives. They're full of socioeconomic perspectives. And those perspectives may even be true or helpful in a worldly sense, but often their counsel offers no help and no hope because even as they profess to be Christians, their counsel offers no God. It is a moralism. 
So where is the God who is sovereign over all things such that every man and every molecule serves his good purposes and who will one day make all sin and sadness disappear? Where is that God? Where is the God who can overcome disease and raise the dead to life? Where is the Redeemer who can offer full and final pardon for sins, whether committed in the present or in the past? Where is the Redeemer who is sufficient to pay the full penalty of sin? Where is the Comforter who is a balm and a consolation to sinners and sufferers alike? By not only forgiving sin, but by bearing it away from us, both our sins and the sins of others with which we have been sinned against. Where is that Savior that is able to bear away our sins like that scapegoat in the wilderness and take it far from us? Where is that God in all of our counseling? Where is the master builder who tears down walls of division and builds one new man in its place upon the prophets and the apostles with Christ Jesus at its cornerstone? Would we seek to tear apart the thing that Christ has built? Where is that God? Where is the master builder who is building this city? Is our eye on him? Do we long for him? Do we look to him? Where is he in all of our counsel? Where is this God? To whom do we flee when the wicked seems to be winning? In whom do we find refuge when the world is on fire? Brothers and sisters, we currently have a president that is disqualified to lead this nation morally through this through this time and the very best candidate that would replace him is no more qualified to be a more moral leader in our situation than, than our current president is that who you would hope in would you wait for a good speech would you wait for the right legislation that is not where your hope should be Our hope is not in chariots. Our hope is not in horses. Our hope is not in politicians. Our hope is not in social policy. And if it's not in these things, then where is our hope? To whom do we flee when the wicked are winning? In whom do we find refuge when the world is on fire? Like David in verses 4 and following, we go to the Lord. Because He is the indestructible foundation of the righteous. I want you to notice, glancing in verses 1 through 3, how David's counselors never once mentioned God. And yet here in verse 4 through verse 7, in four verses, David is going to use God's covenant name, Yahweh, Jehovah, four times. Where does our confidence come from when the world is on fire? Our confidence comes from knowing God and taking refuge in Him. Our confidence is to say with David, In the Lord I take refuge. And that confidence is strengthened by knowing no less than four things about God. And we're going to see these four things in the following four verses. That is that God rules, God sees, God judges and God rewards. God rules, God sees, God judges, God rewards. Consider verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. The Hebrew word translated temple here can also be translated palace. The Lord is king. His palace is in heaven. And insofar as it's in heaven, it is far above every human court. And it's in heaven that we see him ruling on his throne. A king's throne is a symbol of his authority to to rule and to judge. It is the place from which he speaks his law and he governs all things. When the world is on fire, God is not frightened. He is not scrambling to gain back control that he seems to have lost over the world. No, nothing happens in heaven above or on earth below that the Lord does not ordain or overrule. God is sovereign. But if the sovereignty of God is to be a real comfort to us in times of trouble, it's not enough simply to acknowledge that He governs all things. We have to know how He governs all things, and that's what we see here at the beginning of verse 4. We see that God's rule is both holy 
and heavenly. Obadiah Sedgwick, the Westminster Divine, said this, Divine providence is an external action of God whereby he conserves and governs all things wisely, holily, justly, and powerfully to the admiration of his own glory. God's providence, that is, God's sovereignty in history, Moving, guiding everything to its appointed end according to his glorious decree and for the good of his people. God's providence is ultimately the work of an infinitely wise, infinitely good, infinitely powerful God. That is where David starts. This means that even when you and I can't see or understand how all of the details in our life or in our culture or in our country or in our communities are playing out or for what purpose we can never let, nevertheless cast ourselves on the one who does. When David looks for refuge and hope in the face of trials, when the city is burning, he begins with the sovereignty of God. That we can cast ourselves to the one who sees all things. And that's what we see secondly in verse 4. Not only does God rule, but God sees. See that there? His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. That from his throne the Lord watches the world. And to say that God sees is to say that God gazes upon or, or scrutinizes something. We see more specifically in verse 4 that his eyelids are testing the children of man. To speak of his eyelids testing is to speak of him like an appraiser that is scrutinizing and evaluating an uncut gem or a work of art for its true value, for its true worth. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place. How many places? Every place. Keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now we don't consider him like some removed creator who's just watching it, wound everything up and just watches it go. We just saw that he is sovereign, that he is sovereign, he is holy and heavenly, he's guiding all things, so he's not a removed God and yet he sees all things everywhere because he is an all-present God. He is in all places at once and thus able to see all things at once, even the things that you and I cannot see. So what should we think when it seems that God isn't doing anything? We should be confident that he is carefully watching and scrutinizing the world and he is testing the thoughts and intentions and actions of every person. In fact, the wicked, verse 3, think that they can shoot in the dark. You glance back up at that. They think they can shoot in the dark. They think nobody's going to see it. Which is the reason that rioters are always at night. Looters always come out at night, rarely in the day. They think they can get away with it. And if it's up to human justice, many will. But though almost everything is hidden from our sight, nothing is hidden from his sight, not only the actions of men, but even the hearts of men. The Apostle John tells us that Jesus, in John 2, needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. That's why John recalled later on in his revelation, Revelation chapter 1, that when he saw the Christ exalted in his heavenly glory, he recalled how his eyes were like a flame of fire, pure and holy, able to pierce into everything and see it for what it really is. All hearts are open to Jesus Christ. Every desire, every intention, not just every word spoken, but every thought that has ever been thought is known to him. And when we stand before Jesus, we stand before the God who sees everything. Oh, listen, brother or sister, and I say this specifically to my black brothers and sisters, If you have felt unseen and you have felt unheard, I have no doubt that that is true. 
There have been many times in my own life where I have not seen and I have not heard as I should. God always sees you and God hears you because he is the God who sees. Our Savior has eyes like the flame of fire. And though injustice in this world may escape our own self-righteous evaluations that is always interested in exonerating ourselves, He sees things exactly as they are, even more purely than you who have had injustices perpetrated against you. All hearts are open before Christ. He is the God who sees everything. But as I said, we don't need to mistake God for a passive observer, a kind of divine voyeur into humanity. Our God is a God who acts. God not only sees all, but we see in verse 5 that he judges all. Look at this. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. He says, let them rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. You notice, first of all, at the beginning of verse 5, that the Lord tests the righteous. That word test refers to the process of proving the worth of a precious metal. One reason that God allows suffering into the lives of his saints is to test their faith. God tests the righteous in order to prove the genuineness of their faith. God tested Abraham when he commanded him to offer up Isaac. He tested Israel in the wilderness wanderings, and he continues to test his people today. That's why Peter writes, 1 Peter 1, In this you rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. But what is the purpose? So that... So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who we really are and what we really believe about God and His Word is not revealed in our prosperity, but in our trials. It is not revealed when everybody loves us. It is revealed in those moments when we are treated most unjustly. Why is God willing to strip our prosperity to test our faith? Because Peter says, our faith is more precious than gold. You can have all the gold in the world, not a worry in the world. All of the power, all of the influence, and if it comes at the cost of faith in Christ, then you have lost. Faith in Christ is worth more. It is more precious than gold. Why is that? Because Christ is more precious than gold. And he alone is our hope. Why does he bring trials? Why does he bring difficulties so that the world would not be precious to us anymore, but so that Christ would be precious to us? So that vengeance wouldn't be precious to us. But that Christ would be precious to us in such a way that we would trust that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That he would be so precious to us that we would even be willing to take up our own cross and to follow him, even as he did so silently in the face of wicked men. Our faith is more precious than gold. You can lose the whole world, and yet if you gain Christ, you have everything. Yet if you gain the whole world and you don't have Christ, you have nothing. God sends trials to test the righteous. But this testing fire, whereas it's purifying for the righteous, it is devastating for the wicked. We saw that in the second half of verse 5 and in verse 6. We see that God's soul hates the wicked. That soul is just related to his being, of who he is. 
We like to think that God hates the sin, but not the sinner. But the Bible teaches that God hates not only wickedness, but the wicked. It's one of those uncomfortable truths. God's wrath is a natural and necessary part of his love that if God loves that which is good and beautiful and pure, he has to hate everything that is set against it. If I say I love my wife and some other man assails my wife and I go, well, stuff happens, you would go, you are a wicked man. You have no love for your wife. Shame on you. Why would we think that God with a far more pure love would react any other way to wickedness against his glory and his people, against the bride whom he loves? God would be less than God if he was not a God of wrath. His love for his people would be a fraud without an equally passionate hatred for the wicked. And so God is on his throne. He rules. And his throne is in the heavens, so he sees all things. And everything that he sees, according to Psalm 11, he judges. And those whom he judges, verses 6 and 7, he rewards. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, and he loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. We see, first of all, in verse 6, that God rewards the wicked. God's judgment is not a fantasy, and it is not a fiction. It is not something that religious men have devised in order to control the masses. It is whom God has revealed himself to be, not only in his creation, but in his word, and ultimately in the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. Fully and finally and most clearly at his cross. God's judgment is not fantasy or fiction. We see at the beginning of human history that God rained down coals of fire and sulfur when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But that judgment was just a glimpse. It was a trailer of a, of a feature attraction of a fiery judgment that is coming again. That's why the Apostle Peter warns for the good of his hearers. And this is God's grace to those who would hear. The heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Not just sin, but sinners. That is terrifying. But for now, God's judgment is delayed at least his full judgment, as he watches and he weighs the world of men. And the Bible teaches us that this isn't because God is slow to judge, it is because he's kind and doesn't want any to perish. And his kindness, according to Paul Romans 2, is meant to lead us to repentance. But make no mistake, Oh, friend, if you are one who has scoffed at the gospel of God, who, have, who has refused his great grace offered to you in Christ, if you are one who thinks yourself not a great enough sinner to need that kind of mercy, listen, just because God has not judged you does not mean that he will not judge you. He is patient and he is kind so that you in this very moment might hear his word once again that you might stop in your tracks, no longer evaluate what parts of your life would not be scrutinized by God and thereby judged by God, but rather to realize that you have been scrutinized, that you have been found wanting, and that you have no hope to stand before a holy God. The judgment is coming. The wicked will be destroyed. Every wrong will be set right. Every tear will be wiped away from the faces of those who have hoped in and are waiting for the Lord. Look at verse seven. For the Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds and the upright shall behold his face. God promises that those who trust him will see his face. This promise carries no consolation to you in the face of deep and fiery trials if you don't love God. You will not be motivated by seeing God if you do not delight in God and treasure God above all things. 
But this is the greatest reward possible if your heart says to God with the psalmist, oh, your steadfast love, it's better than life. Do you believe that? This is the longing and the hope of our weekly benediction. That the Lord would make his face to shine upon us. That he would lift up his countenance upon us. And this is our future hope. That no longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. And they will see his face. Coram Deo, the face of God, the very presence of God. Christ is the only hope for every sinner in a world on fire. Yes, God hates the wicked. And yet in his great love, Christ turns wicked people into righteous people. Not merely by reforming them morally, but he changes them from enemies into friends by eliminating the very enmity, the warlike state that is between them and God. That for every single sinner who would repent and trust in Christ, Christ willingly drank the portion of your cup so that you could behold his face. And in a world on fire, A world that has been set on fire in part by our own sinning. We have a hope. As one brother put it, if you are in Christ, you have been eternally invincibilized. You're you're as invincible as Jesus is. Though your flesh and your riches may fail in this life, though you may die, yet you will live. We are a resurrection people. This life is not all that there is. And so even as we lament sin and suffer in this world, I appreciate one author put it this way. Christ loved his own all the way through death itself. What must that mean for you? It means first that your future is secure. If you are his, heaven and relief is coming. For you cannot be made unhis. <laughs> I love that. Relief is coming. Why? Because if you're his, you can't ever be made unhis. I hope you never unhear that. He continues, he himself made you his own. And you can't squirm out of his grasp. That's first of all. And it means second, that he will love you to the end. Not only is your future secure on the basis of his death, but your present is secure, proven in his heart. He will love you to the end because he cannot bear to do otherwise. No exit strategy, no prenup. He will love to the end, to the end of your lives, to the end of all of your sins, to the end of all of your temptations, and to the end of all of your fears. That is the God of David. That's our God. And we know him better than David knows him because we've beheld the glory of God in the face of Christ who has been shown into our hearts and that this is our reward, that we would glorify God and that we would enjoy him forever. Brothers and sisters, we are a people who lament the reality of our own sin, the reality of this world. And yet we do not lament as those who have no hope. And so I invite you now to
to lament with me. Let's pray together. Give ear to our words. Oh Lord, I pray that you would consider our groanings. We don't have the words. All we have are groans. We don't know the right things to say. We don't even know the right things not to say. And I pray that even now, Christ would be perfuming our prayers to you. Give attention to the sound of our cry. You are our King and our God. It is to you that we pray. That in the morning you hear our voice. In the morning we come to you and we watch for what you're going to do. And yet we also watch our world. We watch a knee on the neck of an image bearer for close to nine minutes. We've watched a store owner beaten to an inch of his life. We've watched Ahmad Arbery be profiled, hunted, and killed. We've watched our cities be set on fire. We've seen businesses destroyed. We've seen futures destroyed. We've seen one act of injustice circling back to another act of injustice, and it seems that this crazy cycle is never gonna end. And yet, even in all of this, we see our own hearts reflected in sinful anger, in despair, in hopelessness. Father, this is not how you created your world to be. Sin has destroyed everything, and we are culpable, and yet we cry out to you to be merciful. Be merciful to your people. Be merciful to the families of those who have been slain unjustly. Be merciful to those of us who would politicize it for our own purposes, for those of us who would mislead or misguide or misdirect out of our own self-righteousness for fear of ourselves being culpable in any way. Father, for all that we can't see, you see it. The eyes of your son are like a burning fire. They pierce even into our hearts and our very motivations. And there are none who can stand before you. We need your righteousness given to us. Father, we feel that this world is broken. We live in a country that is broken. We live in a country that has been scarred by four centuries of racial injustice. It still is present today. We live in a world that still thinks that politics are our answer and not the gospel of your son Jesus. We live in a world where the, the church should have been an advocate and yet we were not. Help us to not be that again. Help us to be those who love their neighbors in such a way that we speak up for them, intercede for them, to pray for them, to show solidarity with them. Not just the black community, but even in our own state as we feel it closely with the Hispanic community and those who have immigrated here. Father, may it never be said of us, of your people, that we think any less of other image bearers than we might think of ourselves. Rather, we would think so lowly of ourselves in light of your glory that we would see others much more highly. Father, I pray that you would 
bring about some kind of justice and peace, even if just for a moment, help our president to lead contrary to himself. Father, give us the words, help us to to mourn with those who mourn, to weep with those who weep. We ask you that you would do this knowing that you rule, that you see, that you judge, and you reward. And so we are those who lament in a world that has been set on fire, but we do not lament without hope. You are our refuge. Pray in Christ's name, amen.